Well, it all started. This is it all starting. Yeah, are I'm these on? Curious about that. These are on. If you need to talk directly to the people, just look right in there and <laughs> maybe speak your truth. Yeah. Um, yeah. So here we go. Welcome. Thank you. Uh, to what is episode one of my new podcast? How did you get here? All right. This is a podcast in which uh, I sit. I have conversations with people who I admire and cherish, such as yourself. Mutually. Mutually. Uh, I ask them, you know, about what choices and preferences and actions have led them to where they are right now. Uh, we're going to take our time with this. We're going to enjoy it. We've got, I think, about 40 minutes here. Great. 30 maybe. So Great. Um, I'm thinking this might be a little licensing loophole. It sounds like my uh, someone's calling me and my ringtone's going off. This is my ringtone. Wow. So who is that? Deborah Cox. Dude, and she's got the other song with like Joe, their like breakup song. That's the only song I know by her. Oh, okay. How did you get here? Yeah. He wasn't supposed to be here. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> I've tried that love thing for the last time. She had some hits. Like she was like a Faith Evans contemporary. Yeah. Yeah, nice. definitely in that band. Is that vein. really your ringtone? Oh, okay. No, but I'm thinking but maybe. Oh. I don't know. I get, this, I get it. I get it. If and when this thing blows up, I don't want Deborah coming after me. You know, she might give you her blessing. Yeah, I think she would, based on how beautiful these podcasts are going to be. And also, just with the nature of Instagram, you can talk to your heroes on a more peer level than ever before. I might you know? just DM her and just be like, DM "Look, her. here's the deal. Here's my idea. I don't want to be dodging these. You know." trying to find loopholes why don't we just agree on something you know let's make a loophole. hole uh, a loophole. hole <laughs> this, could, this could go bad <laughs> <laughs> all right so today on the show uh <laughs> um uh my first guest is jonathan coleman uh john <clears throat> john is a great friend of mine uh we've been creative partners uh i admire his vocabulary uh his talk smile uh, his creative genius and his work ethic, which has kept him thriving as a full-time musician in uh, the city of Philadelphia, where we are right now. Um, so one thing I want to do in this podcast, I'm going to do this with every guest. There's this kind of joke that I have with like, you know, Boyder and Brian and I kind of do it a lot. And I'm sure you're <clears throat> keen to it. It's sort of like the suburban dad who shows up to the party, the barbecue, and is like, you know, how'd you, how, how'd you guys get here? Uh, you know, we, we jumped on 30 and... Uh, Took it all the way down to the to the blue route, and that kind of uh, dumped us out on you know that whole kind of spiel. It's like all oh, that light at Corningstone is wild, right? It's wild what the, they're doing down the there. Left man. arrow, <laughs> does it ever turn on? <laughs> exactly. Sure. Yeah, and if it does, it's for two seconds. Can't even <laughs> make the turn. So I wanted to ask you, even though I kind of know, how'd you get here today? You drove me. I did. <laughs> so that, that covers it. That covers it. Everyone's gonna have a different story. Yeah. Um. In, in in the Deborah Cox song that we just listened to, there's a <clears throat> a key change at the end of the song. Do you know what from what to what? I don't know from what to what. I'm guessing it's a whole step rise, but we'll have to check it out. Well, this is exactly <laughs> why I why I brought up the key change. I want to hear from you. Like, pretend you're talking to someone who doesn't know music. Okay. What is a key change, and what is the effect that you know the producer or musician is trying to achieve by creating that key change? In your words. Sure. So like assuming this is a whole step rise or like listening to any Barry Manilow song or something, what is achieved by shifting the existing melodic material up a whole step is a lift. You know, it, it pushes the song further. If it's like a double chorus out, you do the whole step rise and the track moves up and you feel, you know, maybe some kind of uh, endorphin release or something and you get the musical goosebumps and... You know, but it can be really trite if you're listening to like a whole night of songs that end <laughs> that way. <laughs> a lot of lifting, like how high can you go? Yeah, and then you can do like you know negative key changes too. You know, drop down, like going down a minor third. If you're just like, trying to make people feel worse. And yeah, worse. it's like whoa, like the song's depressing. It's yeah. like oh, it's worse. But I think there is like a, a, a f an actual physical physicality to that too. Like you know, I picture I'm in the car with 
Kathleen or like my sister or someone and, and we're, there's like an Alicia Keys song or like Beyonce when that key change comes like everyone physically is like well think about love on upward. top love on top right. is just going up going up going up and every time you're like yes yeah oh my god yeah it just gets better do it again better. you know <laughs> until we're at like the 12th key again an octave higher you know? right and then it's full circle and robots are singing it because it's impossible yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Mariah Carey maybe could get up there yeah um, cool. Happy birthday to you. Thank you. Your yeah, birthday I just passed. I celebrated a birthday, January 6th, 34, Capricorn, and uh, surrounded by many wonderful people in the month of January, and uh, never have struggled with Christmas being so close. It's kind of, it's like a nice thing. Christmas, yeah. New Year's, my birthday, it's always, it's always been good to me, so. It's like a month-long celebration. Yeah, I, I feel like people who have a birthday on, like, Christmas Eve always get that question, like, oh, is that tough? Is that hard? Like presents and then presents Yeah, like again. what do they is do? That, like, you know, is that difficult to yeah. be so lost? <laughs> clearing that up. <laughs> um, what, what, what are the uh, qualities of a Capricorn? Well, there is a, there's extreme organization, which I don't really like think I fall too hard under. Uh, there, there are some often like leadership qualities derived from, which I like, I can't deny sometimes like, if I'm in a rehearsal or something like that, I, I just I've like seen that first I like the ship to move, you know, and I like to try to be aware of the different personalities in the room or the endeavor and what can we all do or how can I act to move this forward to get the best result in the most efficient way with lifting everybody up. Because anytime that I've been uh, inspired to move forward or do something by being put down, you know, maybe the work got done, but I felt like shit. Right. So, so is, it, is it really? So anytime I've been in like a band situation where I've been made to feel like that, you know, or you get vibed out by some older or younger musician, I'm always taking a note. I'm like, all right, cool. Like it's exactly how I don't want to behave. Yeah. That that's probably that in itself. That observation and and ability to be like take that in and be like, I don't want that to be a part of me, or I do want that is probably something that every good leader has, right? I hope, you yeah. know, I mean, and also I'm never like, that guy sucks forever. You know, like people have days, people mm -hmm. have moments or are dealing with whatever, you know, and I'm sure that I've vibed people out or like, you know, in my effort to steer this ship smoothly. Right. Being a dick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you can't, you know, you can't you win know? them all. Yeah. You have to, you, you, you have really can't. You, you really have to can. grow. That's interesting. All right. Capricorn 34 you uh I used to shoot these like videos for you where you'd play the bass and go through your effect pedals and it was so fun oh my god and they're built, great they're on YouTube yeah check them out and you built a website and you described yourself as a human first a yeah. bass player a friend etc yeah um, and I love that. How, you know, what does your tagline say today on Jonathan, at Jonathan Coleman? Is it Jonathan Coleman? I think it's just like, how, well, I don't really use that website yeah. anymore. Um, just a quick brief note about that before I circle back to this. There's so many platforms. So many. Today. Facebook, Instagram, God forbid, Twitter, TikTok, TikTok. <laughs> TM. <laughs> and it's like, am I going to have a website too? Like, can I just do one and one of these really well and the other one okay and, and i'm leaving twitter out of it and yeah i'm a fan of that philosophy like i think put all your eggs in one basket and crush it there because i don't know i feel myself getting spread thin when i'm like oh, i have to go do a tweet thing and i think depending on what you do like you know my partner holly she makes her imagination come to life whether it's like a calendar or a pin or a t-shirt or a blanket with her on it and she needs a retail space for this stuff. Mm -hmm. So her website really serves her showing her product, selling her stuff. Yeah. But for myself, I'm more like, um, can I play bass on your record or your gig? It's like, I'm on, you, know, you don't have to go to my back to the Instagram to... thing. You can just reach out to me, reach yeah. out to me. I'd love to play on your track. Maybe your gig <laughs> calendar depending. <laughs> but what the tagline at, was at, at friendship wizard. Yeah. At friendship wizard. Uh, the tagline on my website at the time, and maybe an iteration or two of business cards, which I have also since phased out, mm -hmm. was person, musician, bassist, improviser. Ooh. Beautiful. Now, I, feel, I 
absolutely stole that this. That remains? From a Bass Player Magazine interview with a bassist named Brian Bromberg. And it just resonated with me because it was like when you choose a vocation or a vocation chooses you and you're so, this is me now, this defines me, this is my life, you can forget about the part that really fuels that is you. It's like you're so wrapped up in the identity or this like <clears throat> the archetype of being a professional bassist or a jazz musician or a singer songwriter or a, a graphic designer. Whatever the like, title may be. It's like, it's like, okay, are you a, do you have parents? Are you a sibling? What are, you, what are your friends like? You know, mm -hmm. what's your, what's in your refrigerator right now? Right. <laughs> Sometimes I see people and I'm like, what's in their fridge? And that could be their tagline. And they're like, <laughs> <laughs> at Friendship Wizard, you know, you there's know, currently maple bacon in my fridge. You know, like the two, like, you know, <laughs> you know, some people I'm like, what's in their fridge? <laughs> so, <laughs> mad respect. And some people I'm like, oh my God, like, I'm sure they have like, they have three fridges. Yeah. And what's in those? Yeah. <laughs> It's one in the garage. What's in their freezer? Right. <laughs> <laughs> but I, I don't think I have a tagline. I, I've been joking around with the hashtag Lydian Daddy. <laughs> I love it. You're in my phone as Zex. Okay, yes. There was a, this is a little hot of a topic, but we'll yeah. identify that real quick. It was circa 2000 something at the Grape Room the night before the bike race party. Great venue, Man Young. I was hanging out with Amy McKeon. Mm -hmm. We were laughing around, laughing about putting like, you know, LOL, but LOX, mm -hmm. laughing out xylophones. We were like ROFX. We were just doing an X as much <laughs> as we on could. Rolling xylophones. Yeah, and then I was like, whoa, like what if we put the X in the front? Yeah. And then like sex, right? X E X. Zex. Zex. It was just so funny. And I was making everyone change my name <laughs> in their phones to that. It worked for me. So it was like maybe 10 people. So like Amy, Kelly, Dan Hirsch. I wasn't there, but you're you're in my phone. Is that I'm so sure I'm in that as Brian, you know, and and a dear friend of mine, Steve Clifford, uh, one night convinced me to change it because it was my Instagram handle. And he's like, dude, you got to. You got to change that. <laughs> That's interesting. Too. It's like, it's horrible. Yeah. <laughs> it's so bad. <laughs> he was right. It's he nice was... to be told that sometimes. Oh, uh, my God. Yeah. Speaking of like, you know, monikers and just like finding that identity and being like, this is my thing. You yeah. Know? Like uh, happened to me with like a cool stick. You know, Tim Sonnefeld was like, dude, you guys have to change. Like, I've never met like a more talented group of people with a worse name. And we were like, no, oh, this name's awesome, you know? But yeah. looking back, it's like, yeah, it kind of stunk. It's hard to name something. It is. And that's why I'm so grateful for Muscle Tough. Because, one, I didn't have to name it. I didn't name it. And Ross, Ross Belenois, uh, musician extraordinaire, guitarist, producer, gentleman, he had the idea for the band name. And I think the chant, before there was a tune and before he called a bassist and a drummer, so the idea, he he just the a, idea of mu muscle tough, muscle tough, I can get a room to yell muscle tough and they won't know they're doing it. And and, and muscle tough, like to, to yell muscle tough. <laughs> People are always like, it, it's muscle tough. And we're like, yes. And no, they're like, muscle tough. They're like, so you're all Jewish? And I'm like, none of us are. None of us. Well, explain what is muscle tough, you know, for, for somebody who's, who doesn't know what your band is. Muscle tough is a comic book jazz bizarro party funk trio that is somehow straddling the jazz and the jam world and it's instrumental it's improvised it's uh psychedelic it's fun it's really fun and uh i really get to actualize all of my like interests and the things that have really inspired me musically i get to like explore with those guys and I have an insane offensive rig of pedals and two amps and more than anyone should be bringing to a gig. I can but, attest to that. But yeah. that's like my voice and that's like my world. And it's so nice to have that space to create with. And I'm so grateful for Joe and Ross and the kind of democratic creativity and you know business aspects we share. And we have a great team in place and we're growing something really cool. And it's... Uh, it's been about five years, which is the longest band thing I've been involved. And it's cool because 
we're all doing the same thing. We're all freelance musicians. We teach, we do random gigs, sessions, recording, you know, uh, to varying degrees. And then we all kind of come together to do this thing and we are very respectful of each other's time. And Ross goes to Europe all the time and uh, Joe has a family and we make everything work and there's no static and it's just, I'm just so grateful for those guys and I, have grown so much by being involved with the, just being around them as a person and as a musician. And there's a great Pat Metheny interview. He's a, a famous jazz guitarist where he's like, if you're not the worst guy in your band, get in a different band. <laughs> and I really feel like I'm the worst guy in the band, <laughs> like affectionately, you know? I mean, Joe is, is the best drummer in the band and he's the second best guitarist, or he's the, probably the, your second best guitarist and maybe the best bassist in the band. I don't know. You know? I didn't know that about Joe. He's so good. Really? Oh my God. He shreds guitar and bass. He did a bass gig the other night. Like he's, I didn't know he could play anything. But and Ross is an incredible bassist and a better drummer than me. And you know, part of that is too, um, or it factors into why us switching octaves, which is something muscle tough does. We, uh, will trick you not on purpose, but, I will have my bass sound like a guitar, wee, 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 ripping leads, and Ross's guitar will sound dum, 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 dum. and his producer mind really kind of, it doesn't matter whether it's a guitar and a bass in his hand, he's going to do the role appropriately. And I've had other situations where I've tried to have guitar players play bass for me. Hold down that low end for like, you. Like, here's this pedal, like, here, I'll bring another <clears throat> bass amp for you. And they don't have the, the instinct per se. So while the tone was there, the the role wasn't you know filled to my support and delight and ross can ross can really do that yeah yeah he really can um in the theme of how did you get here uh and, and it's you say when as you say that i can i can like feel your excitement which is a a rare thing i think for somebody who's been in a band for five years um you know like an independent local band and you guys are like doing it and like I've known you for a long time and seen you in different bands and I can sense your passion and love for this specific one. It feels like it aligns perfectly with you. Prior to this, you know, what were those other bands? How, how did you? Oh my God, <laughs> this is gonna be great. <laughs> um, so first band, uh, Jesse Chu. If you don't know Jesse or didn't get to know Jesse, one of the all time great guys. And he was the first Absolutely. musician that I knew. So as soon as I started playing, I was like, all right, I'm going to tell this guy that I play now. And I like went, I had a bass. Immediately I got effects pedals. I had this like Aria Pro 2. It was like a chorus, a something, and a delay all built into this like little shitty $50 unit. Stoked. And I went over to his place and we played like Smells Like Teen Spirit and a Blink-182 song. And he was drumming, right? Yeah. Just, you know, really... To, to my level, as much as I could. There might have been Limp Bizkit rearranged. The doo -doo -doo -doo. You were the worst player in that band doo -doo -doo. at the time. Doo -doo 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 -doo. <laughs> um, so that started, and then we were like, all right, we need a band. And somehow Dan Hirsch, who had a great Marshall stack and some awesome ideas, Andrew Hohorst came involved, Sue Jirasi, and I think we were called Fleeing Massachusetts. <laughs> Maybe we were. I, I, what what grade are you in, or how old are I'm you? I'm a at freshman this time? in high school. All right, sweet. I started playing bass freshman year of high school, and we played a gig at this place called the Lloyd House, which was like a youth group home in Downingtown, and we rocked. Like Dan's hand bled. It was great. That's badass. <laughs> you know, people that's how you were, know you're in a band. People like, were yo. there. My dad came, who you know continues to support me to this day. And sometimes it was you know, to my chagrin to have my dad there. I was like, oh. This is, is this lame? But he said something great to me that night because he probably drove me there and he was like, listen, like, you, you know, you guys sounded good. Did you enjoy yourself? And I was like, yeah, dad. Oh my God. It was the best, like music. And he's like, oh, I, I couldn't tell, like you weren't smiling at all. And that started it all. Yeah, I was gonna say, that's, that must've been the last time. That's <laughs> when it started. <laughs> I, I, like, I talked oh. about your talk smile in the beginning, but your play smile is even better. You know, I, got, I, somebody, I played last night and somebody was like, you look like you're like aware of an inside joke the whole time. <laughs> <laughs> that's a great way to yeah, put it. It's yeah. like, well, the music uh, we were playing, Trap Rabbit, 
it's fairly complex anyway, so we all are kind of like, here comes this next section. Are you ready, bro? But uh, so that eventually, I think Dave Spencer may have been in that band at that time too. That eventually turned into Hot Fossil Project. I remember that Which name. was like the first, you know, talk about forgetting about who you are and identity and you're in high school. That was me, that band. And right. like we were sick. I'm the Hot Fossil Project guy. We like. rehearsed. We had, we maybe had a website. We made CDs. A MySpace, perhaps. Um, you know, we had a couple great concept jams and, you know, maybe a few songs. I believe I had written a song about dreaming, which is a real continual concept for my songwriting, and maybe a song about a pirate, and I think that might have been it. Um, but uh, very influenced by Fish. and Still in- are, right? Incubus. Oh, yeah, um, to this day. 17 years of deep inspiration from the greatest rock band in American history, in my opinion. Fish. You know, people will really be upset with that. And that's, <laughs> that's a beautiful okay. thing. They're that's so okay. polarizing, but yeah. I, I love fish. But I don't want to talk about fish yet. Continue talking about your bands. So Hot Fossil Project, and like, it was great. We crushed, we had awesome things happening. It was like pre-Facebook. I went to college that fell apart, you know? Jesse's health, but he couldn't do that. And the distance was difficult. I was in Pittsburgh. <clears throat> A couple times they came up and stayed with me and we came home for a show and I was in music school so I was surrounded by musicians all the time. So everybody wanted to start a band. A dear friend of mine, Ben Hartenstein, was like, you are going to be in my band. And I was like, fuck, sure. And we formed something called Black and Glass Factory, which was an awesome four or five guys in music school really trying to push the envelope and play out their shit and a song in every mode and fun covers. And we were playing bars even before we were 21. <clears throat> and uh, it was just, it was so creatively satisfying and amazing. And we had fans and mm, it was a beautiful time. And that ran its course. We had trouble having a drummer, which can be, re- you know, there's always any endeavor you have or I've had in the past, there's always been one chair that's been hard to hold on to. Hmm. For me, it's always been hard to hold on to a great drummer. Hmm. That morphed into a band called John Levan and the Curious Gentleman. And we we imagine like guys with monocles, mm-hmm. but like the, the gay community of Pittsburgh was like interested in the band. <laughs> <laughs> there was like, there was gentlemen who came out to show us who were curious. And we were like, oh, we're just like, we're a bunch of like, you know, straight just, white just, guys. Just based on your name. Yeah, just based on the, the name. We're like, we're like more like Dave Matthews band than the Scissor Sisters. Right. <laughs> so, you know, that was fun. And John Levan is a great songwriter and singer. And um, I had just a band full of friends and we all lived together. And it was like six guys in two houses one washer and dryer, which was in the basement where I lived in college. So people were doing laundry all hours of the night. So So college. (laughs) Awoken, you know. And uh, through that time, I was like studying jazz at Duquesne University. Incredible experience. I learned so much and still am continuing to download and, you know, squeeze the sponge out from the time I was there and, you know, make sense of all the lessons I had. And like right around when I was graduating, this band 28 North, who had, I'd met at Duquesne, and they, you know, left school to pursue being in a band and really built something for themselves and some traction. And they were like, dude, like we're touring. Like, I think I like left my graduation ceremony without even like catching up with my professors. Like Jeff Mangone is my vice professor. This guy, David Cutler, who was an incredible theory teacher, this guy, Mike Tamaro, incredible arranger. I didn't go say like bye to them and thank you for the last four years. We went to Philly and we played the TLA. Mm. And it was like, Ugh. and that was the next phase of my life. I moved in with those guys. I was a school bus driver. <clears throat> and That was your tour, your tour bus, right? Well, we, yeah, we all drove school buses around. So we would drive our kids oh, to that school. That was your job. Yeah, okay. we'd drive our kids to school. We'd come home and we'd rehearse. We'd pick them up, take them home. We'd come back and we'd rehearse or people would be hanging out with their girlfriends, but it was like a very cool family vibe. And then we would tour and we built and we built and we built. We eventually moved to Los Angeles and we're like working with all kinds of producers and playing the strip and it was great. And for me, I got burnt out 
I wasn't taking care of myself and it really caught up with me. So I had to like eject mm -hmm. and I moved back to Philly and I had like no gigs. And then I started playing with you. Yeah. And you know, that was great. Yeah. You guys saved my life. You know, I was like, I was like watering plants at yeah. my mom's house. Yeah. <laughs> so, and then I, so then I started being, I was a lunch lady at the Votech school in our hometown. I Phoenix recall home. that. That's an amazing Incredible gig. Incredible you, time. There's so much love for everybody at TCHS Do you have like, Pickering. I don't want to, uh, it's like, no, no. Oh, please, I, please. Do you have this, like a great story? I feel like you used to tell me so many good stories <laughs> oh my God. from that era. Like what's a great story from your, your lunch lady days? Where do I start? I mean, I used to have this, uh, I had this like cardboard sign um, that was like a, like a bored face with like a speech bubble that said, okay. <laughs> that like sometimes kids would just be like, you know, doing a bit that I wasn't interested in. I would just <laughs> hold up the cardboard. <laughs> and they I definitely loved And I was like a school. bartender, like, you know, like, all right, here comes, here comes this kid. You knew right, your he's clientele. Saying, he gets this like Wawa lemonade. The and, regular like, cookies. And like, I know he's <laughs> he like, we didn't even talk sometimes. We'd just be like, mm -hmm. and then some kids gotcha. really opened up. And like would tell me about their problems, and I was able to communicate with people who mattered at the school that could do something about that, and yeah. we like would work in tandem, and it was like this beautiful thing because they were like I wasn't exactly an adult, you know, I had like tattoos, I had like right. long hair, and they knew I was in bands, and they could I, one time I played Good Morning America with this artist Viv and the Revival. I remember Joe that. and I did, and the whole school watched it and like tuned in and like. <laughs> made signs and they made it like a teachable moment. They like showed the kids how to use social media and like we're like tagging the band and NBC and like all, of, you know, it was like Super That's Bowl amazing. Friday. It was like a really beautiful yeah. experience. So, so I love that. You. And it was amazing because I barely, I mean, I, I worked while I was there, but I, it wasn't a lot of hours. So I could, I began teaching around that time too. This company Greensleeves uh, out of Westchester I had reached out to a friend and they put me in touch and I started teaching. You know, I didn't study that in school. I studied music performance and I, I definitely practiced a lot. And I always regret not doing music technology because I feel like I would be way better at music, like caressing sound and understanding compression and EQing, you know, stuff I've learned. Um, Which you do have an understanding. Yeah, I've, I've learned from friends who are awesome at it, but I feel like I would have practiced just as much. Mm -hmm. But, uh, you know, it also gave me a lot of time to mess around and, and waste my time. Yeah. So, uh, you know, if I could go back. Not that I'm dying to go back, but right. if I could. Yeah. But I started teaching for green sleeves, And I'm still doing that. And it's awesome. I go into people's homes. I know all these different dogs. <laughs> um, and, you know, I, the youngest kids are four. Sometimes I'm teaching people who are in their 50s. And just learn to deal with different people, seeing what motivates them and moves them along. Uh, it all benefits me. Mm -hmm. And to be talking about music all day is great. Yeah. And uh, I did that for a while, um, was playing with you, starting to do random work, all coming out of the grape room scene, Manny Young scene, which is kind of an incredible entryway into the Philadelphia scene. For sure. You know, it's part of it, but it's like, you know, it's Manny Young. it sucks to park there. Yeah, it sucks. So it's really hilly. It's hard. It's and, difficult. And busy and post college. -y. It's very post college. -y. But the grape room I owe a lot to too. Scooter like gave us residencies and all kinds of gigs there. Scoot, good luck, you know. And Scooter. that was that was definitely a, a stepping stone for us too. And it's still it's going fun. on. Like yeah. it's still cool. Like a lot of my friends like are involved in a jam night there on Wednesdays and I just never go because I just, you know, I can't. You can't park. I just, I can't park. No, I just thought, <laughs> it's just, you can't do everything, which is an important thing to learn, you know? Um, <clears throat> that is important. You can't do everything and be the best version of yourself. You know, you'll be yeah. spread too thin. But I was just, all right. So we played at the Sullivan Hall. It might've been like City. a Christmas thing. It was a Christmas. And Ben Hartenstein from Black and Glass Factory came out saw us, hung out, and was like, why don't you stay another day and play with me and this drummer, this dude, Lonnie Soloway. We played, and it was sick. And we were like, let's form a band. So we did. And it was called Chen City, and ah. it was all instrumental, improvisational stuff, you know, prelude to muscle tough. And we really, you know, we were, and I remain obsessed with this uh, guitarist named Wayne Krantz, mm -hmm. huge influence of mine. 
up there with fish. And we were trying to do the Wayne thing, and we were okay. You know, we were okay. We really tried, and it was difficult. They were in New York. I was here, so I would, like, travel up there to rehearse. And we did gigs in both cities, and eventually we tried it with a Philly drummer. And around that time, via, you know, getting known for using a lot of effects and improvising, Ross had reached out to me about Muscle Tough, and that just took off. You know, we were in the same city. We had incredible chemistry, and it was an undeniable, you know, path to follow. Mm -hmm. And uh, those are kind of like maybe the bigger beacons of things that I've been involved in. Yeah. And I, you know, Trap Rabbit is a band that I'm so proud to get to be a part of. And um, I get to play with so many amazing artists, you know, uh, that I, we don't have the time to sit here and name them all, but I'm grateful for it all. And I, I, every experience informs the next. And absolutely, I like to have a nice, well-balanced musical diet. So if I'm just improvising and doing bizarre effects stuff, I would be craving playing a song. Mm -hmm. You know, so it's nice to have a blend. So yeah, beautiful. So that was like my whole trajectory of bands. That was that was a wonderful little little journey that you took us on. <laughs> nice. If any of if you if any of my compatriots are watching this or remember any of those times, great times, right? <laughs> great times. That's how you got here. Um, cool. We're coming up on like the end of our time. Fuck. I know. How I, I could go for. How another. did this happen? I know. I'm pretty sure. I haven't said anything yet. 10 to 11, yeah. All right. So I'm going to move through the end, but I want to I get these questions in. Um, okay. You did mention, like, your your dad and, like, that advice that he gave you. And I've not, not even just recently, but I am and I think always have been interested in just, like, upbringing and parents and, and environment. And, what like, how would you describe your parents slash family and environment growing up and how that's affected you? Incredibly supportive of every whim and fancy and idea I've ever had. And it's amazing, even if it didn't make sense to them or, you know, sometimes when they were against it, mm -hmm. they've supported me through and through and continue to, mm -hmm. and I'm so grateful. And, you know, to go from just being a kid to being like, I want to play electric bass. It's like, what's that? Yeah. They got me one, mm -hmm. you know? And like, I didn't want to go to college. And they're like, you're going to go to college. It's like, well, could it be for music? And they were like, sure. And my dad dragged my ass through the process of mm -hmm. going to college. And I got in. And, uh, and I'm sounds like so, you, so grateful for it. I was going to say, you, you spoke about Duquesne a lot. It sounds like there were some like, pretty pivotal like, experiences. Oh, my God, I learned. I mean, I couldn't read a chart. You know, you put a jazz standard in front of me. I was like, excuse me? Mm -hmm. What? And I learned so much about ear training and harmony and playing in a group and running a group and uh, and really putting in time. So mad, so mad love to Duquesne. Uh, so it was mom, dad, and uh, sister, right? Yes, Caitlin. It was just the four of you growing up. And yep, so, and so. Yeah. various West Highland White Terriers coming and going. I was going to say a couple, couple dogs. A couple dogs, yeah. a couple dogs. <laughs> various West Highland Terriers. <laughs> Westies for short. Um, hashtag. Great. Um, I know because I, you know, have the pleasure of knowing you, I know that uh, hygiene is something that's really important to you. Can you walk us through your hygiene? Uh, is this true? <laughs> you, yeah, you once made a comment to me. You were like, dude, my hygiene's on fleek. <laughs> well, it must have been I like, think you had like great breath or something. Like, I was what just was like, it's... yeah, you smell and you just. Well, um, <laughs> you know, brushing, flossing, rinsing, every now and then the activated charcoal. For, okay. for the whitening, you know, yeah. try not to swallow any, but just I've dabbled in that. Yeah, uh, you know, I bathe. Uh, I bathe, man. I got <laughs> Dr. Bronner's. I got uh, I don't know what the brand is, but I use a nice tea. I like tea tree, sandalwoods, cedar esque kind of scents. That's another fun fact about you. You love a, a scented soap. Yeah, yeah, I do like a good soap. You know, nothing too like. Bath and Body Works, like vanilla, like right. like Dream Beam, but you know something something earthy, you know, <laughs> More as like, close to patchouli as I can get without upsetting my mom. Yeah, you know? <laughs> and uh, <laughs> you know, you trim the beard. Uh, you know, I try. I use coconut oil in the beard and you know under yeah. the eyes too, so to kind of fight the aging. And, yeah, and uh, yeah, I don't know. Um, your top three MCs. Q Tip. Buster Rhymes. Wow, this is like such an incredible on-the-spot question. Talib Kweli. There you go. 
could think about that more, but yeah, just, but I wanted it to be more like that. Yeah, and uh, I, I but I love like I love Method Man's voice. Yeah, you know. Yeah, it's yeah. He's got a presence on a track. He does. Yeah, it cuts. Charlie Tuna from uh, Jurassic Five. The deep voice guy with the rap and the track. He's at the truck with the truck with the <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> Didn't know who you were talking about. Do now. <laughs> uh, rap was a big. I mean, we even talked about rap. Yeah. You know? Before bass, it was all rap. And then Limp Bizkit, Corn, 311, Fish, and Jazz, and here we are. Yeah. Okay. Um, and we'll just keep going until they, until someone says something. All right. Do you want the song? <clears throat> I do. Or should we wait? I just want to get to, like, one or two more things that I had here. Okay, cool. Um, your relationship. You're in, a, you're in a nice relationship right now, right? I am. I want you to speak on it a little oh bit. Oh, my God. What c- can't I say about Holly? Yeah. Uh, I'm so matched. We're mirrors of each other, and it's incredible to stare into and, and to be seen in. And uh, to, you know, be influenced by her art, to have her be inspired by mine. I mean, to her chagrin or not, she has discovered that she's a bit of a jam fan. Mm. She loves a jam. Mm-hmm. We've gone to three fish shows. She comes to, you know, a lot of my performances and, you know, seeing her smile and move and be part of the music has been really inspiring for me. And uh, she just has my back and I have hers and I feel very safe and trusted. And, uh, you know, it goes both ways. So I love her. That's so, beautiful. so grateful. That is beautiful. Because, uh, again, just like your bands, I've seen you in and out of many relationships. You yeah, know? you know. So it's cool to see you, um, you know, uh, just like you are happy and muscle tough. This seems like a, 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 just a great relationship for you that I'm excited for and, you And well. like, you know, the bands too. Like, I mean, any relationship is – it doesn't fail for lack of trying. Mm-hmm. You know what I mean? And it's never like, you know, just one person's fault in these democracies, whether they be love or – or uh, band Bands. stuff, <laughs> and you know, and like in a band, a benevolent dictatorship is sometimes ideal. Mm-hmm. But in a relationship, you you can't have that. No. <laughs> so. give and take. So yeah, that's great. Um, yeah, I think uh, yeah, let's have you play an original tune. All right, because you, you I've you, had a request. You from the host. could add to your your uh, moniker's songwriter. It's true. I have got some great. I've written some songs, mostly to get a laugh out of friends, but uh, I have slowly and continue slowly to embark on the process of making them in a digestible format. And my friend Eli Winderman is a great musician and is working with me to produce what will be like, I guess, a solo album of my original material. And you played me some of the. the, the demos, the yeah. demos, and they sound like you know, like you said, it kind of started to make friends laugh. But when you played me the demos, I was like, these are beautiful songs. Like yeah. they really are. So like I played like rudimentary keys, all the guitars, all the bass, the singing. Eli does the ripping keys, and we did some drum programming on that. But you know, it'll be kind of the same process. But we'll get probably Baldacci to play all the. No, definitely Baldacci to yeah. play all the drums and. You know, I like the idea of doing it all in our homes. Yeah. It's the idea, it's just to pay for a studio space with what this started from. No. I just can't envision it. Yeah, and I think it's. I think it uh, fits the music. Oh, yeah, we're getting. Hey, hey what's up? Just, there's a session right after you guys. Oh, okay. Oh, yeah. Oh, careful. Oh, 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 oops, sorry. Sorry. <laughs> uh, yeah, I just, yeah, so wrap up. All right, cool. Leave the tripods in here and the 6D camera. Leave that all here. Yeah. Oh, great. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, no problem. Play that tune. Okay. Yeah, just play it. Friendship is the best. It's what dreams are made of. In high school, I passed the test. It's what dreams are made of. Friendship is a place. Where dreams combine and the memories replace. Friendship is the time where epidermis combines in a high five. All oh, friendship is the best. 
That's what dreams are made of In high school I passed the test It's what dreams are made of Friendship I'm gonna treat this as our outro wind. music so you keep playing I uh, just want to thank our guest today, Jonathan Close Coleman. Sleeping, much to your Such a beautiful human, beautiful soul, great friend Friendship of mine. Is a Such mist. a fitting song here. Friendship. Wake up when you're dreaming and you feel like it's a kiss. Friendship Jonathan, thanks for your time mist. today. This has been episode what one of How Did You Get Here? I'm your host, Luke O'Brien. Thank you for joining us. Yep. Yeah, yeah, we're all finished. That was perfect. <laughs>